Hello, everybody, and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mics, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every day, and our co-sponsor CardHoarder.com, offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. I am Evan Irwin, and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Aaron Campbell. Hello. Ruben Bressler. Hi, how are you all? We're great. You're fresh off the uh, the sweet broadcast. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I had a good time doing that. I am I was very nervous, but I think it went well. Yeah, that went uh, terrific. And Aaron, you've been playing a little bit on stream? Yeah, I did my Patreon stream last night, and I had some really lovely people stop by. A lot of, fav- a lot of uh, faces that we recognize from our Discord and people that we see in our Twitch chat were lovely enough to stop by. I played Gruesome Menagerie in Standard, went three and two. The deck is really sweet. And then I played uh, Chill Dredge in Modern and was two and one before the night was over, and the deck is broken. Um, and so I had a really, really good time. Everybody was lovely, a lot of great friends, uh, people who had nice things to say about us. So thank you to everybody who stopped by. Got a couple subs in the process, people who came to follow me as well. And so it was just a great night overall. Well, nice. That's terrific. That's good to hear. Um, that said, uh, we also have another choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call Honorable Mention, where uh, Ruben will tell us who was the most luxuriant and letting us know what card we didn't choose as one of our top 10 merfolk. Ruben? Uh, this week's winner comes from the YouTube, and it's from Gabriel Rocha Ribeiro, who writes, None of you guys chose Thrasios Triton Hero. Why? He's a perfectly fine dude, a 1-3 for 2 mana that has an ability that can be activated later in the game when you have nothing to do with your mana or as many times as you want when you have infinite mana in Commander. This merfolk goes through your entire deck, putting all your lands into play and drawing as many cards as you want. Being cheap means you can play him early to get some presence on the board and maybe get some value, and the Commander's attacks won't affect you that much in the future. Having partner means you're not bound to play only green and blue, making widening the possibilities of your deck. This fish does it all, and for that reason, definitively, should be on the list. Thrasios definitely has a huge target on its head, and you can usually tell, like, you know, so sometimes when you're playing a commander game, you try to, like, assess the situation. Like, you look at everybody's commander, and you're like, okay, that one's that one's kind of a silly commander. You know, that one's a little spiky. But when you look and somebody, like, reveals their commanders, yeah. plural, and one of them happens to be Thrasios, you know you're in for some nonsense. And so that definitely kind of puts a target on your head of, like, I'm watching you, because nothing good ever. No, There's no real fair way to play that card. Well, yeah. for those who don't know, Thrasios Triton Hero is a rare from Commander 2016. It is a green and a blue for a 1-3 legendary merfolk wizard. It has four generic mana colon, scry one, then reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped. Otherwise, draw a card. So, Speaking of Commander, I want to give a shout out to the EDH Rec podcast. Apparently they listen to our show or they watch our show and they had heard us kind of talk about Simic um, the other day and how we felt like Simic might have been a very popular color combination and they were nice enough to set us straight. Apparently, according to their records and their their statistics, Simic is actually only the fifth most pop- popular color combination, Golgari is nice. the number one in Commander right now by leaps and bounds. So I was like, oh my goodness. And so they were very lovely. They left us a little comment on our Reddit page and said, hey girl. We like you, but you right. <laughs> well, that's not our area of expertise. So happy yeah. to be happy happy to be corrected. Yeah, Absolutely. So uh, like to see uh, how EDH is shaped up. Yeah, and Thrasios is bananas, uh, particularly because the partner mechanic is just broken in general. When you're playing normal Magic, you start with a seven card hand. When you play Commander, you start with a seven card hand plus essentially an eighth card in your hand that has a special ability. Yeah. When you play Partner, you start with nine cards in your hand, and Thrasios, when paired with Popularly with Vile Smasher the Fierce or Timna the Weaver um, is just an extremely powerful, uh, uh, potent card. It's also super cheap and easy to get on the board. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all those factors combined seem terrific. So, yeah, I'll take it. A busted little merfolk for our top ten. <laughs> um, it's not fair. There's nothing fair about that magic card. That said, we're going to talk about our top ten most flavorful cards. This was a very difficult list for me to put together. It was yeah. an oddity in many ways. I found it very easy, in fact. And, and there are, but there are so many ways to go about it. You know, you could go down the road of, you know, whether or not it's faithful to a character or a story moment. Um, I'm more of a top down, <laughs> a top down design person where, you know, I love the things that are sort of ported over from the real world and whether or not they live up to the things they're trying to pay homage to. And so a lot of my things are things you could find in the real world and happen to match that very well. And so those are kind of the designs and the flavors that I really look for. And uh, yeah, but there are a lot of possibilities Like you really could go through just about every set just just scan and it's it's a huge pool yeah 
yeah, there, it was just kind of how do you create the exact right criteria for me? And like, I liked it. I lo love the top down stuff, but also like the really resonant stuff, something that kind of tells a story or something that mm -hmm. just kind of makes a point that maybe even is so subtle, you may not get it at first, which I, yeah. I think I have one of those, which I'm, I'm really excited to talk about. But e either way, we're going to get here to our number 10. Aaron, can you kick us off with our number 10? Yeah, so speaking of EDH, uh, this card was recently released in Commander 2017. Uh, immediately uh, jumped up in price. It's sitting around $25, $27 right now um, and was a nice kind of tie-in to Dominaria. This was the moment that, if I understand correctly, Vorthus is, feel free, to, feel free to correct me. This is the moment that Teferi attempts to prevent an invasion uh, from happening on Dominaria. And so he weaves this giant phasing spell and essentially blinks an entire region or an entire city. Um, the problem is there are some circumstances that happen in the magic storyline that makes it difficult to get them back and so a lot of what we see in dominaria is teferi kind of dealing with that and whether or not he made the right decision and whether or not he wants to spark back and all of that so this card really really emphasizes that moment my number 10 is teferi's protection uh teferi's protection is two colorless and a white it's an instant it says until your next turn your life total can't change and you have protection from everything all permanents you control phase out while they are phased out they are treated as if they don't exist they phase in before you untap during your untap step and then you exile to fairy's protection this is a back-breaking card if you happen to walk into this if you're making that kind of lethal swing if you're about to do something incredibly broken your opponent can just sort of peace out on that and um it's just a huge card when you play i think it really conveys the impact of of doing something so seismic like that of making an entire area just disappear um and then being able to exile it kind of saying you know signifying that Terry would never want to do this again you know most people when you see an instant you find a way to like flash it back or snapcast it and oh no you shouldn't be snapcastering it this was something that he did to prevent something and now he's not sure that was the right thing to do and so i really feel like that this card carries sort of the pathos and the and the impact of this card it's just a beautiful card on top of that shout out to chase stone for the art but this is my number 10 yeah i feel like and this is weird but i feel like the only part that's kind of that that, that falls a little short for me on this one is the mana cost mm -hmm. it's just like a white and two generic mana for like that should be this like crazy spell that you know just blinks you out of existence an entire you know land yeah. just goes away like if it was like three white for example um you know I can see that. something that you know it's like that you have to put a lot of man a lot of white men to make this happen um it, you know it's almost it feels almost too cheap essentially for for the huge monster effect it's it's representing yeah and that it's sort of showcasing um and, and i know that i know they did that to keep it playable and it's a you know, 30 dollar card and whatever and that's great and it's a judge promo now too yeah yeah so so it's a great card no doubt about it and i love everything else about it. what you said was perfect it's just, I was like, mm, I just wish it was kind of, hmm. yeah. <laughs> and it does tell the story really well. I mean, it's a, it's a really sad card. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know the story as, you know, Teferi, when the Phyrexian invasion happened, he tried to phase out parts of the, of the world to protect them. Um, and then when he tried to phase some of it back in, Zolfir couldn't get phased back in, sort of got locked away. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the, in, the, in the meantime, or not really time, in the mean meta time, uh, Teferi lost his Planeswalker spark. And so he thinks that he can get it back if he were still a Planeswalker. And I guess he got a power, sort of. He got a power stone, I think. Right. Yeah, from China. Um, that might be able to restore him to his Planeswalking self. Uh, or did restore him to his planeswalking self, and he might try to bring back Zalfir in the future. But it's really, I mean, ties in with Zalfir and Void from Dominaria, mm -hmm. uh, and a ton of the uh, like the uh, apocalypse uh, back in the day, the invasion, plane shift apocalypse storyline. Mm -hmm. um, you know, first time phasings appeared in over a decade. Uh, just a crazy, crazy card. So I feel like we're going to see a lot of Innistrad cards. Shadows for Instruct cards. So like <laughs> a lot of top down, a lot of really cool, flavorful stuff. So I'll just go ahead Guilty. and just, just <laughs> smash that one over the ship and you know and get into something that's that's like ting ting ting. Ting ting. Ting ting. And you're like, what's in that? That's weird. Ting ting ting. And slowly it's this giant piece of ice and it and it's gonna have these little mm. cracks in it. Ting 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 ting. And it's gonna shatter, there's gonna be something freaky inside of it. Because there's a thing in the ice. They call yep. it thing in the ice. <laughs> I just, I want to note that we we've kind of become used to it, but it's a thing in the ice is a magic yeah. card. Uh, the front half of this is blue and generic mana for an 04 rare horror. 
with Defender that has four ice counters on it. So whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, remove an ice counter from it. And if it has no ice counters on it, transform it into dun 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 the awoken horror. The giant Kraken horror. It's a seven, eight. And when this creature transforms into awoken horror, return all non horror creatures to their owner's hands, which was funny because every once in a while they'd flip it and you'd actually have one. And you'd be like, Oh, that, yeah. that one doesn't bounce. That's weird. That's how that works. Yeah, but, uh, uh, for a spell sky mm -hmm. or a um phyrexian revoker mm -hmm. i believe are both horrors absolutely so. so uh yeah so thing in the ice is one of those cards that it, it was good enough for constructed play uh you know anything that kind of flips over into such a big monster you kind of have a payoff just plain magic as you as you are you can be a little bit more spell heavy uh thing in the ice was great for me to show like i can show someone hey look it's thing in the ice it's literally a shadow that turns into a big monster scary thing that's going to kill everybody i just mm -hmm. i love it yeah, sometimes these play in older formats, you know, when when people first saw that it required, you know, four instances of sorceries, you know, in older formats, it, you know, it's not very difficult to, you know, you had Gitaxian Probe at the time, you know, you had things like Sleight of Hand or even Serum Visions, it was very easy to get this thing going. Metamorphose was another card that gets a fence chain. My friend Daniela Diaz, who I lovingly like to talk about on the show, Holy Diva, she had played around with what they called Suicide Blue, um, mm -hmm. which was sort of her take on kind of the Kiln Fiend thing in the ice, you know, kill you and bounce your things. And um, it's sometimes he's playing Legacy, maybe as far back as vintage sometimes um so it's a card that definitely sees eternal play people were really excited about it very surprisingly easy to get going i was playing it in the sphinx's tutelage deck where like you just needed to buy yourself some time and then you could certainly try to mill them out with your can trips or if that didn't work fine here's a couple seven eights have a good time and so yeah very flavor flavorful very scary card and definitely one that the brewers latched onto pretty quickly yeah all right so we'll move on here to rubens number 10 what you got so uh this one is near and dear to my heart because i used to love drafting this card uh for its effect um I, i'm i'm a kind of guy that i like finding subpar draft archetypes and then just latching onto them and and hammering the crap out of them uh everyone who's ever seen me stream uh the latest core set or almond cat draft knows that i love me a dirtily gift of paradise deck for example mm -hmm. in formats where that's not particularly good uh, and then uh, back when Conflux was in the draft environment, I used to love getting as many copies of Un... I'm sorry, of Quenchable Fire as possible. Uh, mm. Just sort of playing a control deck and then having a bunch of copies of, of Quenchable Fire, which is pretty bad, but was fun for me. Uh, and it's also quite flavorful. So Quenchable Fire is three colorless and a red for a sorcery from Conflux. Quenchable Fire deals three damage to target player, or Planeswalker, we've updated the uh, Oracle text on that one. Nice. It deals an additional three damage to that player or Planeswalker at the beginning of the next upkeep step, unless you pour some water on it. Unless that player or that Planeswalker's controller pays a blue mana before that step. Nice. Which is hilarious. Um, you know, it, it would deal the three damage, and then you could try to put it out if you had extra blue mana laying around. Uh, this is also sort of uh, an honorable mention for a card called Matenda Lion. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> back in the day, that was set it's from. Mirage, Sorry. I believe, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it's a Mirage mm -hmm. card. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it is a Mirage card. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a 2-1 that when it attacks, the defending player can pay a blue. And if they do, you prevent all combat damage that would be dealt to the lion because you quenched the lion's thirst. If you let the lion drink your water, it won't hurt you. Um, and Quenchable Fire, very similar. If you quench the fire, it won't keep burning you. And I just thought that that card was a, was a really fun, interesting, weird design. And because of the mana pip in the text box, you can't play it in a mono red uh, commander deck, which is hilarious as well. Nice. <laughs> Matana Lion, also just a breaker of my heart, because again, I love Savannah Lines, and Wizards is like, that's here's another Savannah Lion, but it's got to suck somehow. <laughs> it's, a, it's a worse Savannah Lion. Oh, and they, yeah. did, they did worse Savannah Lions for about a decade. It was great. Yeah, yeah, but now we get Pelt Collectors and other one mana right. things. <laughs> that are stupid and ridiculous yeah. and whatever. Yeah. Quenchable Fire. Savannah Lions and Popper now, isn't it? Wasn't it Popper? Wasn't it downgraded recently? Yeah, and yeah. Masters yeah. 25. Yeah. Uh, what a world. Yeah, how the mighty. But... Quenchable Fire itself is all, it's a very rare card because Wizards, and this comes up every great designer search, every time they talk about design, they hate the memorization cards, the cards that you have to remember exist, that they remember they're going to trigger in the future. Something's going to happen and you can't forget X happens. And this is not a common. So like this was right around the time they were kind of changing all the rules in terms of the New World Order or whatever. And the idea of, you know, you got to remember next upkeep, this is going to happen and don't forget. Otherwise, you know, you're kind of out. 
Um, so you don't see a lot of cards like that anymore. And then whenever they try to bring them up during the great designer search, it's like, oh, don't make me remember anything. They get super mad at you. Um, that said, that is number 10. Let's move on here to number nine. Aaron, what's number nine? So like you mentioned, Evan, Shadows over Innistrad, like original Innistrad, really leaned on these kind of gothic horror tropes. There's horror tropes. You had Thing in the Ice, which was a take on John Carpenter's movie, The Thing. Mm -hmm. You had the uh, Elusive Tormentor, which was the idea that vampires could turn themselves into mist. You had a Cursed Witch, which was the theory that if you kill a witch, it leaves behind a curse, you know, and a killer. And so a lot of really neat, uh, you know, kind of things were in there that called back to other things. Even just the name of the set, Shadows over Innsmouth, is a story by Lovecraft. Mm -hmm. Um, about a city that eventually and there's an author and he's going mad and he thinks the city is and it's obvious that the set was really inspired by these things and um, another thing that was really prominent in this set and we kind of got the this was kind of the hook and then we got the or we kind of got the what is it with drinks there's the chaser and then there's the uh, there's the shot and the chaser. the shot and chaser yeah so the shot is my number nine and the chaser came in the next set uh, my number nine is triska decaphobia mm -hmm. um so triska decaphobia is an enchantment it costs three and a black it says at the beginning of your upkeep you choose one each player with exactly 13 life loses the game and then each player gains one life or each player with exactly 13 life loses the game and then each player loses one life. So Triskaidekaphobia is the fear of the number 13. Um, the art, Willem Murray, if you really look closely, there are so many things in this artwork that add up to 13. You have the tools, you have the blood stains, you have everything like that. Really look at the art of this card. But little did we know that in Eldritch Moon, um, the new Emrakul was 13, you know, had the 13, you know, 13, 13. That was really kind of the, this was the shot and this was the chaser. And this was just a really neat card of flavor when they really leaned on the 13. This was also something that the brewers were trying to play with. Like, can I make this work? And I don't think anybody really did. Um, it was reprinted in Masters 25. And yeah, this was just a really nice little thing to kind of sneak in. And you could really only do this in like an Innistrad set where, you know, you have the werewolves, you have the superstition, and now you have the number, the fear of the number 13. And then ultimately the number 13 really meaning something. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, it, just absolutely killed it in the artwork like the number of logs the number of rivets in the in the barrel i mean like everything is 13 and it's great yep. um why did they have to reprint it masters 25 <laughs> like it's like really you're gonna pay so much yeah. for a pack and this is your rare like guys yeah. <laughs> I gotta say, I really like uh, my Arcades, the strategist deck, when I'm able to attack with a gigantic uh, Tree of Redemption. That's always fun for mm -hmm. me. <laughs> crack, crack um, that yeah, the number 13 is a huge deal in all of the, uh, the Innistrad expansions from the original, when you had Blasphemous Act and Into the Maw of Hell. Uh, oh, to yeah. and tragic slip also mm -hmm. uh, up until you had uh, Triskaidekaphobia and Ruthless Disposal and Tree of Perdition mm -hmm. and lots of the uh, and obviously the new Emrakul uh, just some some excellent usage of the unlucky unlucky for some number yeah well th my Ruthless Disposal I'd basically completely forgotten about that card wow <laughs> yeah, I mean that one's it wasn't good. What does that do? I'm going to have to look that one up. It's a five mana uncommon sorcery that you have to sack, you have to additional cost, you have to discard a card and sack a creature. Two target creatures get minus 13, minus 13. It's on the turn. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a fun limited you know, card. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That said, room watch number nine. So I want to talk about Jesus for a moment. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Jesus. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, confusion around jesus because a lot of people make the joke that jesus was a zombie but he wasn't mindless and he didn't consume anybody uh that you that, know of that we know of it, it, that it was written down i mean it was a while ago so who knows maybe he did but you know canonically speaking in the literal sense of the word of canon no you know he didn't eat anybody uh he wasn't a ghoul or a white because his uh um even though his soul and his mind was intact he wasn't rotting away from the inside right when he rose where from in the, the world are we going with this <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't a vampire because he didn't live on blood he wasn't a ghost or a wraith because he was still corporeal and had his wounds of course uh so canonically i think jesus was a lich and that's my number nine lich <laughs> is black 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 for an enchantment lich please uh, lich please originally from <laughs> alpha uh the current text of which reads as lich enters the battlefield you lose life equal to your life total yeah you don't lose the game for having zero or less life if you would gain life draw that many cards instead 
whenever you're dealt damage, sacrifice that many non-token permanents. If you can't, you lose the game. And when Lich is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you lose the game. Uh, this card is... It, it turns you into a Lich. It turns you into uh, this powerful mage trying to get eternal life uh, and 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 you're binding your soul to an animated corpse in the sort of macabre way that a lich does. Um, and uh, and so yeah, I think Jesus was a lich. Um, and they they misuse the word lich a lot on magic cards. They confuse the word with zombies. I mean, we just had Josu Vest Lich Knight, who is a zombie knight. And let me tell you, the Vorthoses fought over that one. They were like, "That's not a lich." Right. I mean. <laughs> You know, it's they they use them interchangeably. Um, this is one of Richard Garfield's favorite designs when he uh, was coming up with ideas, and they, uh, was really happy when they came out with Lich's Mastery in Dominaria, which he says is a sort of fixed version of Lich. They tried in the past things like Lich's Tomb and Nefarious Lich, um, but this is the and then Lich's Mastery was really the masterful version uh, where they really actually fixed it. Lich was such a cool old card. Um, that they that was really the essence of a flavor uh, win. Yeah, as a boss lich myself, um, I was really excited by Lich's Mastery when it was spoiled in Dominaria. And shout out to Ali Antrazi, God bless him. Uh, he just recently came up with a five color Lich's Mastery list, which only he could do, and only in, a, in Return to Ravnica said where the mana is, is so available. Uh, go check that out on coolsniffing.com. I thought about playing it on the stream the other day, and I was like, this is an Ali Antrazi deck. Like, this is kind of like a Molnir thing where he can use it, and the rest of us just, we can't pick up the hammer. So, um, but if you are interested, I think Stefan Olive kind of puts around with it a little bit, but I would love, I even open Lich's Mastery, my pre-release set, and you were, Evan, you talked me out of it, because I remember I was streaming it, and Evan was like, don't do it, don't do it, and I was like, why? And so, yeah. um, it is very flavorful, and I do love the idea of sort of becoming a Lich, kind of like Form of the Dragon, which we might talk about later, but yeah, just becoming that thing, you know, there's, yes. enchantments usually can only do so much, but you really do feel like you have become that, and, and what a thing to become, like, that's so cool. Liches be tripping, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> um, Liches ain't loyal, they ain't. That's right. Um... <laughs> Wow. Okay. Well, this turn really strange and this card is really <laughs> weird and it's just, it's awesome to go back. The alpha text of Lich, you lose all life. If you gain life later in the game, instead draw one card from your library for each life. For each point of damage you suffer, I love suffering, you must destroy <laughs> one of your cards in play. Creatures destroyed in this way cannot be regenerated. Note that. You lose if this enchantment is destroyed or if you suffer a point of damage without sending a card to the graveyard. You gotta send it. You gotta, you gotta mail it over to the graveyard. <laughs> It's also, there was Nefarious Lich, too, um, yeah. which was the sort of a different take on that. And uh, yeah, but they all kind of have similar things in common. Of if it goes, you lose the game. And, you know, one of the nice things about Lich's Mastery is that it's hexproof, so it makes it more difficult to get rid of. All right, there's the mirror, there's the tomb, so many liches, liches, liches everywhere. Mm -hmm. All right, so my uh, number nine here is a, a bit of a, uh, it, could, it could sneak on the radar. This is one of those where you may not realize what this card is actually sort of teaching you. Um, and, and I loved it because I was asking, um, uh, talking to uh, our buddy, Chris Rube. And I said, you know, yeah. I said, give me, give me a, a super flavorful card. Tell me what you got. And he was like, this is it. And I was like, I was like, wait. And he's like, because it means this. And I was like, oh, I totally forgotten. Yeah. Cause I remember from back in the day when new Phyrexia was coming out and it was like, do you know what the definition of decimate means? Ah. Decimate means to take one tenth of whatever it is that you are destroying. Well, Decimator Web does exactly that. Decimator Web is four generic mana for a rare artifact that has four generic mana tap colon. Target opponent loses two life, gets a poison counter, and puts the top six cards of his or her library into his or her graveyard. That's just, yeah. it's just beautiful. It's just a tenth of every way you can win. I love it. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah, especially because, you know, you tend to, you know, you think of the way that you're going to lose and then you try to not do that. So, for example, most people, you know, especially in modern, you got your life gain spells. Well, Infect doesn't care about that. And so if you're playing an Infect deck, your life gain doesn't mean anything. If you're playing a normal deck, you don't really care about Infect. And so you're always convinced that, you know, you're just going to die one way. But this is a card that, okay, fine, you may have 40 life. I'm just going to mill you to death. Like, I don't care, you know, and if you happen to run out of life, that's great, too. And so having such a versatile card with so many ways to kill someone when people are tend to kind of sideboard to prevent just one thing that really makes it a lot more difficult because either way you slice it, you're going to die to something. It's kind of like yeah. a Swiss army knife in a way. Yeah. Just a cool card. Mm -hmm. I've been able to kill someone 
with a sign in blood by decking them and have them go to zero life at the same time. Wow. <laughs> I would that, that and that's a cool achievement. That's a cool achievement. Uh, and the, the joke now is that if you die to sign in blood, you then have to sign the sign in blood in blood. Oh geez. You die wow. both ways at the same time. If you kill someone three different ways at the same time with Decimator Web, that would be amazing. Wow. Yeah. I don't actually it doesn't really work that way because they don't draw the card immediately, so they wouldn't they wouldn't okay. lose for drawing from an empty library yet, but you get the point. Yeah, but if you were able um, to pull but off yeah, that's a great that's a great choice. The hat trick. I think at that point you have to get a tattoo of Decimator Web somewhere on your body <laughs> because it owned you so much you have to carry it with you. That's how bad it got. All right. So I believe for number eight, uh Ruben, you are you're sitting this one out. I'm gonna sit out for a little bit. Uh, for a little, I got, bit. I got, I got no eight, no seven, and no six, as they are all higher on someone else's list. Oh, Lich, please. Um, well, that means I'm also sitting this one out because uh, I have two hires, and this it happens to be one of them. Aaron, do you have a number eight? I do. Uh, so hopefully we're going to talk about Theros a lot because Theros as a block was just dripping with flavor. You know, I think most of us took some form of mythology in school, whether it be grade school or middle school or high school, and, you know, have a base understanding of what, you know, Zeus is and Athena is and things of that nature. And so I, there were a lot of recognizable things from Theros block, whether it be something as simple as a Gorgon's head, which is a reference to Medusa, you know, or whether it be, you know, Curse of the Swine, which goes back to Circe and turning soldiers into pigs. I mean, there were just so many things in the set. Um, but this is one that really stood out to me it's so narrow it's so niche but it just speaks volumes about what it's trying to do and what it calls back to uh, my number eight is eye gouge um, so eye gouge is one black it's from born of the gods it's an instant it says target creature gets minus one minus one until end of turn that's cute. Um, or if it's a Cyclops, destroy it. <laughs> yeah. And so the theory being that the only way to really down a Cyclops is to get it in its one eye. So, you know, if you do shoot someone in the eye with an arrow, well, that's nice. They got two eyes. They'll probably be okay. Um, but if you happen to just, just a Cyclops, it is enough to destroy them for one black. And we see conditional removal all the time. You know, we had Dark Betrayal. Um, you see sometimes self-inflicted wound. You know, black sometimes has those, those really narrow ways to kind of kill certain things. And this happened to be a bit more narrow but what a win just the idea of the big cyclops and you know no real way to get rid of it and the flavor text is perfect it says one chance one throw one perfect hit and that's all you need and it's just so good yeah and there was yeah. i can't remember at the time exactly what was in standard or whatever but i i recall this being playable in both the limited format because there was a lot of cyclopses and there was some cyclops that was playable in standard and some in some degree, and people were trying it out. Um, but I, I gouge again. There's definitely going to be more from Theros on this list. Hint, oh, for sure. Hint, hint. Yeah. Nudge, nudge. <laughs> but <clears throat> that brings us into number seven. Uh, I have a number seven, and this one was very close to another option, and you can probably guess what it is. But but this one was kind of the OG of cards that do this. Uh, this card very much tells a story. I love how it tells a story both in the title of the card, but also the artwork, sort of the mood that it represents. Uh, this is uh, originally from Innistrad. So this is, again, this is where Innistrad kind of showed and like, hey, we're doing this incredibly resonant. You know, for me, a lot of the power of these cards are the resonance when you're like, oh, I get it. Like, I understand that if you're like mm -hmm. out on alone on patrol or something, and you're feeling kind of freaky and weird and there's shadows everywhere, then all of a sudden you're traveling and then you're doomed and you're the doom traveler because yeah. the doom traveler is one white for a one, one common human soldier. But when it dies, it becomes, you put a one, one white spirit creature token with flying onto the battlefield. So you get to kind of come back and haunt uh, the people who may have, have put you there. But regardless, I thought that just, again, the story, the idea, like, look, it becomes a ghost. And it's like, oh, that's so cool. Like anybody, whether or not they play magic can understand that story. And I love that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Hunted Witness is a recent example from Ravnica, which I love that card. It was yep. this close. Um, but I, I felt like, again, Doom Traveler kind of tells the same story in many ways. Uh, and yeah. did it first. So there you go. Aaron, watch number seven. Well, it's no secret that I love a reanimation spell. You know, obviously I'm, I'm team dredge all the time and I, I've reanimated things in just about every way you could think of. You know, I've exhumed them, which is the flavor of literally exhuming a body from the 
ground. I have dread returned things, which is the act of sort of having the sacrificial, these sacrifices that you do. I think victimize is another one where you sacrifice two things and get two things back or whatever. Um, but this is another one from Theros blog that was so flavorful. It was modeled after Orpheus's descent to the underworld, the idea of a creature literally going down there and getting the thing back and then coming back with it. And this was so flavorful. This was something that I was really hoping would see play in standard and it never really did because we had unburial rights and so that was just better on all counts and so uh, my number seven is rescue from the underworld uh, so rescue from the underworld is four colorless in the black it's an instant an instant reanimation spell that's so hard to find mm -hmm. um, as an additional cost to cast it sacrifice a creature and then you choose a creature card in your graveyard and you return that card and the sacrifice card to the battlefield under your control at the beginning of your next upkeep and then you exile rescue from the underworld so i love the flavor of you know you can the underworld is a place in barrels that you can visit and people can in some cases almost go back and forth if you will you know you have the story of hades and and persephone and you know mm -hmm. being in love with him and demeter was mad and all of that and so the underworld is a place you can go to charon is sort of the boat keeper he writes has the ferry that you get down there and this is just a great way of, of, of selling that image of somebody going down and getting someone they love um, and then them both kind of coming back and this is really really cool and i really love this and to me this screams like and i think this was this might have been one of the earlier cards that was spoiled but like if you didn't know what you were in for this really told you what you had to look forward to in Theros. Very nice. I I feel like uh, you know, it, when it comes to usually constructed playability, it's most often cost. You know, if this were four mm -hmm. mana, probably great. But also, take a note of, of the wording in this card. The wording of the card, it, it actually harkens back to what we're talking about with Quenchable Fire, which is a weird almost memorization thing because you don't bring them back immediately. Even if it is yeah. an instant card, it only comes back at the beginning of your upkeep. So you choose the creature in the graveyard, you sack the creature, you return it and the sack card under your control at the beginning of your next upkeep. So you got to wait and remember, oh yeah, I bring these creatures back. You don't get the creatures back, you know, to the battlefield instantly. Um, but, but but again, beyond that weird kind of timing thing, the flavor is amazing in this. And this was certainly yeah. near my list the whole time. Um, yeah, so that was great. Um, yeah, big downside. Yeah, let's so move on here to our number six. This was, I'm just going to get out of the way because I feel like uh, uh, in many ways, this is kind of obvious. You know, some of them I feel like are kind of like bonky over the head. I don't want to bonk over the head too much, but in terms of, you know, again, the story, the resonance, the idea, you get it. It's a great example as to when someone says to you, what's a flavorful magic card? And you go like, well, there's this story. I made a whole freaking episode of Forgotten Lore about this card because Delver of Secrets <laughs> turns into insect aberration and yes we've talked many many times about old delvey uh but delver of secrets i just on the most flavorful of all time i feel it deserves a shot um yeah, yeah. because delver of secrets does tell the story of the fly of one blue for a one one uh common human wizard from innistrad look at the top at the beginning of your upkeep look at the top card of your library you may reveal it if it's an instant or sorcery you transform it into the 3-2 flying insectile aberration, and all of a sudden you're freaky. And of course, they kept the story going, which is the other part yeah. of the flavorful, you know, win of they kept it going and they kept it going all the way through Elder's Moon into like there's three different cards that tell like the the tale of this thing getting freakier and crazier and crazier. And that's fantastic. And that to me is is part of what I'm kind of inferring. I can only choose one card, but really I'm talking about all six till it reaches what its final form or whatever. Like it's crazy. Perfected form. Perfected. I believe. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah. So, the, so that whole chain of cards is just terrific and I couldn't not mention it. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And I was really happy that they finished it out. And, you know, and even though the other versions might not have seen too much play, I mean, I think it was a nice kind of, you know, cap to an already awesome card. And yeah, and, and who would have thought that the card would have such dominance? You know, looking back on it now, it's like, that's really the card? Like, all right. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> and again, I... Uh, this was my number eight. Nice. Uh, I agree that, I mean, whenever a card kicks off a trilogy of a story, I mean, it's... you uh, Choosing transform cards is almost like cheating in the most flavorful cards because each individual, cards tell, each individual card tells that story mm -hmm. so evocatively you have the multiple parts of it comes down like this then there's a, a middle point to the story where it reaches a, a crux and then there's a denouement of the the resolution of the story on the back the card itself is built to tell that kind of story um but delver of secrets does it almost better than anything else it's able to start out as a wizard it does enough research that it turns into jeff goldblum from the fly uh, and then, and then that's that's what happens. Gets that was one of the first horror movies I ever saw, and I can distinctly remember like the milk scene and just ah, like oh yeah. Well, they got ooey and gooey. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, I'm out. I'm I can't. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That freaked me out. Aaron, what's number six? 
My number six is the only higher on my list. It's higher on someone else's list. Well, I had the only number six. How about that? And I guess if there's mm-hmm. only going to be one number six, Delver gets to kind of yeah. be by as lonesome as awesome. All right, here. We'll move on here to number five. Ruben, what's your number five? Um, Number five is from the Arabian Nights expansion. Uh, Arabian Nights was one of the first magic sets, uh, might have been the first magic set, and it was surrounded around the story of 1001 Arabian Nights, which is a collection. I'm sorry? Can I tell you a secret? Sure. Every time I hear someone mention Arabian Nights, I hear the Aladdin theme of Arabian Nights. Arabian (laughs) Nights. Oh, I hear it. It's it's in my head, like as soon as you said it. Of course. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a collection of, of, uh, Middle Eastern folk tales, um, from the, uh, the, the Islamic golden age. And, uh, the story surrounds a king who was, uh, every night would have a different one of his concubines or, uh, uh, folks, um, that he would, um, have, have the evening with. And then in the morning, uh, when he got bored of them, essentially, uh, he would have them executed, uh, some sort of variation on that story. Uh, but until one day that a, uh, a, a woman began uh, telling these stories at night, uh, and he ke- the, the, the king kept wanting to hear more stories and more stories and more stories, over a thousand and one Arabian nights, and eventually uh, Shahrazad saved her own life by telling all of these stories. And it's so flavorful in the way that they that, that Shahrazad translates that into magic. It's a white white sorcery. Players play a magic sub game using their libraries as their decks. Each player who doesn't win the sub game loses half their life rounded up. Shahrazad, the character, built their own sort of sub game as well, being able to say, "Well, you can't kill me in the morning, or else you won't get another story," and saying that every night. Uh, for three years or more, um, and, uh, and and it's just a, a perfectly flavored card for that part of how the story translates. It's the only card also banned in Vintage for, like, <laughs> playability reasons. Banned in Commander, banned in yeah. Legacy. Yeah, when I think of this card, you know, not only is the flavor on point, but I think of just Kaja Foglio, like that art of, mm-hmm. you know, just seeing this sort of smiling woman, that style that we will never see in Magic Art again, of this woman just sort of like, ta-da! just laying kind of on the bed and just you know the art is really what kills it for me but then the, the story really certainly helps uh Sha- Shahrazad, Shahrazad rather uh this just past July it the original artwork sold for $72,000 wow and the original artwork by the way is like this big it's like postcard yeah. like it's super oh, yeah. tiny um rightfully so like whew. yeah yeah that's great it had a spectacular recent moment on camera at a uh, at the unstable pre pre-release yeah where Wedge from the Mana Source uh, used Spike Tournament Grinder to uh, go fetch a copy of Shahrazad and play <laughs> a magic sub-game of Unstable, and that was a, a true delight as well. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Yeah, I remember back in the day, like, you would kind of, you would sort of threaten people with it. You're like, I will play, don't, I will do it. I will go get my forks, and I'll get my Shahrazad, and I'll be right back. I'll don't, yeah. don't make me do this. I will turn this car around, and we will play that sub-game, and then we'll sub-game our sub-game. Yeah, the, uh, the 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 way that I have always heard that you should play against Shahrazad is you just concede the sub game immediately. Right, it's just two mana, just lose white, half white, your life. You lose half your life, round it up. Yep, yeah, that's it. Aaron, what is your number five? We talked a little bit earlier about how the Innistrad sets, you know, kind of capitalize on your fears. You know, we talked about the fear of the number 13. We talked about the fear the fear of the Traveler kind of not coming back. Uh, my number five really capitalizes on another fear. Uh, it's only a 50 cent card, but it is an all-star in my Omnath Locus of Mana deck, uh, where I'm guaranteed to play the majority of the lands as forests. And so this is a very frustrating card uh, for your opponents to have to deal with. But it's a nice way to just kind of get people to leave you alone. Um, and it also really leans on the trope of being uh, scared of getting lost in the woods. Number five's Lost in the Woods. Uh, so Lost in the Woods is from Dark Ascension. It's three colorless and two green. It's an enchantment. Whenever a creature attacks you or a planeswalker you control, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a forest, remove that creature from combat and then put the reveal card at the bottom of your library. This card is hilarious. And so 
you know, when you're lost in the woods, you either keep going and get more lost, which is where you're finding other forests, or you happen to find your way out, which is in theory the creature kind of hitting you or hitting your right. planeswalker. This triggers on multiple creatures. So for example, if you're facing a token deck and there's five tokens, whoop, forest, mm. whoop, forest. <laughs> Just a frustrating card, but I love it in my Omnath deck because it's like 75% forest, maybe even more. But right. um, for a dedicated forest deck, an EDH card is great. <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah this this one yeah, was a, a weird one we we tried so hard to bust this card it just it didn't I think do it Conley no. Woods had played with it at one point too. Right. i was I just gonna say Conley Woods <laughs> streamed a troll deck that was one lost in the woods and yes. i think 70 card deck to oh make sure God. that he didn't deck first which was it's hilarious so funny and i love kind of the randomness of it of maybe it'll get through it maybe it won't will they even try like sometimes they get so demoralized they're like i'm not even bothering <laughs> yeah it's too frustrating you got me thanks yeah i get it I love it. Oh, man. Well, look, uh, number five, top five. We're in the top five most flavorful cards. We are in a card that you can show someone. You can kind of, even just from the name, you're starting to get the idea of it. From the idea, you know, you're, you're chipping away, right? You're, you're somehow slowly making a thing, and then the thing happens, and it's going to be freaky and crazy, and you're never going to see anything like it ever again. In fact, it could very well almost ruin formats. It could bring stardom to some. It could completely wreck what used to be extended um because dark depths is busted but dark depths is super flavorful for what it does there's a big scary creature under the ice y'all it's got a lot of eyeballs and teeth and uh you know that's that's the scariest we have dark depths which is a rare from cold snap it is a legendary snow land and it comes in a play with 10 ice counters three generic mana colon remove an ice counter from it when it has no ice counters on it sacrifice and if you do you put an indestructible legendary 2020 black avatar creature token with flying they merit lage into play that they gave us at the cold snap pre-release that i almost immediately got rid of and i wish i had not because obviously things are worth a million dollars these days um but dark depths is bananas and is banned in modern uh it is a <laughs> a a, a more or less a cornerstone in legacy it's one of those kind of decks that kind of comes in and comes out but like if i hear dark depths took something down i'm like yeah of course it did it's, it's broken the card's done right tends to be more of a budget option specifically the turbo depths decks you know lands has been a thing for a while but that can be kind of costly you need at least a tabernacle and so um that is a huge deterrent to building that deck but why do that when you can just play you know, Lotus Petals, Elvish Spirit Guides, Crop Rotation, and Race to get it out there. And so uh, Merit Lage is definitely a card that you have to be prepared for in Legacy, whether or not you bring Diabolic Edicts, whether or not you bring Ashen Riders, um, you know, that is something you do need to be prepared for. Um, it doesn't really see as much play in Vintage, although Dredge, uh, some people don't know this, but we had a Dark Depth sideboard at one yep. point. The theory being, if you're going to bring in a bunch of graveyard hate, I'll just make a Dark Depths and laugh at you, and that's yep. fine. Um, and so, yeah, a card is, is broken. And there's nothing sadder than, like, you can tell that they don't have it, and they can do this when, like, they're defawing it, like, the slow way, <laughs> when you're, like... Yeah. <laughs> Three mana. Well, I've, I've won a game where I, like, a, uh, where I paid 30, 30 mana over the course of like eight turns. Yeah. Like, you poor thing. Like, you know it ain't going well when that happens. Right. I mean, they're like, fine. I'm, pretty, I'm fairly sure it was Jerry Thompson who essentially broke extended with yep. Urborg, Tomb of Yawgmoth, plus this equals Hex Mage on turn two. Vampire Hex Mage sacrifices to remove counters from a permanent. This is clearly a permanent. And you have a 2020 on turn two. Like, yep. that was. That was a thing, and that format kind of became all about that, and it was yep. really annoying. Was uh was that deck was Thopter Depths, which also yes. had the sword uh oh, um yes. sword of the meek uh Thopter Foundry combo in it as well. Sort of a two card Monty ish kind of deck in old extended that really dominated the end of that format. Yeah. Uh, Evan, all about the ice counters today with Thing in the Ice and. <laughs> I'm expecting Rhyme Feather Owl to make an appearance he's, later on. He's feeling chilly. Chipping away. We're chip, chip, <laughs> chipping away. Uh, number four. Ruben, what's your number four? So uh, I really like cards that, you know, flavor text is great, but if they can make a card that has what I think Mark Rosewater referred to as trinket text, um, like rules text or reminder text, that acts as flavor text. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't even need flavor text on cards when, you know, things like, uh, there, there, are, there are tons of great examples out there. Goblin Game is one of my favorites just because it's so evocative, you know. All those giant red uh, sorceries like Illicit Auction, Thieves Auction, Warp World, Goblin Game. Red has a great history of this actually with trinket text. Things like Rock Hydra, which originally came into play with head counters on it um which was which was delightful uh raging river is another great example of a red card but perhaps the best red trinket text that's ever been 
printed is Obsidian Fireheart. Mm -hmm. Obsidian Fireheart is a colorless red, 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 4-4 elemental, uh, originally from Zendikar. If you pay a colorless and a red, you put a blaze counter on target land without a blaze counter on it. For as long as that land has a blaze counter on it, it has at the beginning of your upkeep, this land deals one damage to you. And here it is. The land continues to burn after Obsidian Fireheart has left the battlefield. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. I wish. That, I mean, how can you not? Like, it's the. I think it's the only card that has blaze counters on it. And um, I was. I would hope in the future there would be more that just like lit a permanent fire, like Obsidian Fireheart does. And I just. It's just adorable. Oh, it's it's, it's fan freaking fantastic. I there there are uh, there is one other card that uses blaze counters, and that would be Five Alarm Fire. Oh, from, okay. Yeah, from Gate Crash. Um, Obsidian Fireheart again. When this came out. This was in Zendikar. Zendikar was like, Zendikar was bananas. Zendikar was a, it was so like, it was just so special. I, it's hard to, to sort of kind of put the words in it, but like Zendikar was unbelievably exciting. Uh, it was, it was coming off the heels of, you know, showcasing all of the new enemy fetch lands, which we'd never had before. It was land-based. Landfall was an amazing, was an amazing mechanic and, and like continues to burn. I, it was just it was too much, too much goodness and flavor for me. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I want more of this. And then they never did it again. And you're like, maybe just like once we can have these little like land continues to burn, like phrases that don't necessarily make a lot of sense. But when you read it in the card, you're like, oh my God, that land's never going to stop burning. It's always going to be that way. <laughs> you can make your own special little blaze counters if you want to show like, you know, little flames of movie. Super cool. Um, but yeah, it, this card never hit constructed, unfortunately, but man, is it super cool. Chris, awesome. Aaron, what's your number four? My number four is a card that you might be a little surprised that I'm talking about. And I was a little surprised that it is, it's a top-down design. Like it is something that surprisingly exists in the real world, albeit by a different name. Um, but it's not necessarily for the reason, or it depends on your interpretation. It could be argued as to how faithful it is, but I think it's pretty dang faithful. I know I've certainly seen, I've certainly had to look at a bunch of them. Uh, my number four is Graf Digger's Cage. Oh, wow. So Graf Digger's Cage, I uh, know. I uh, know. Uh, so Graph Digger's Cage is one colorless. It's an artifact. It says creature cards can't enter the battlefield from graveyards or libraries, and then players can't cast cards in graveyards or libraries. So Graph Digger's Cages are real. They are known, are known as mort safes um, and were used uh, in Scotland and like in Western Europe uh, in the 1800s, uh, actually as a way to prevent grave robbers. It was actually meant to keep people from getting to the bodies, not necessarily the bodies coming back themselves. They didn't really see anything about the superstition here, but back in that time, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of medical breakthroughs were made by, by stealing corpses and working on corpses. Um, and people were very religious. They obviously believed in sort of the sanctity of the dead. And so it was a way to kind of keep people from getting their corpses stolen. But um, I guess sort of the unintended purpose is that if you did happen to believe in zombies, well, you're really not getting out now because someone's put a cage over you. And so the original intended purpose was not for that, but the sort of byproduct of that is, yeah, if you happen to come back, you're kind of screwed. And so um, a really flavorful card and just that it is real. A lot of people don't realize that. I was very pleased to find that out and just a neat way of kind of bringing that to the game and you know you could argue that the you know that the portion of it where the creature cards come from the library the library is often seen as kind of a metaphor for knowledge of the mind you know that could be kind of the way of, of keeping the body snatchers away and then the graveyard part could be the unintended consequence of keeping the undead out so very flavorful flavorful card in a lot of ways and just i just i had to put it on here wow I, very nice that's not wow. not on brand hashtag not on brand um <laughs> I still hate her, but yeah, it's here. right, right. But the flavor game, was too game good. Respect game. Yeah, exactly. Like it's a real thing, and that's, if you're going to be like, graveyard hate, at least be correct graveyard. Hate. Thank you, thank you. Like, what's a void? What's a ley line? What's what's that? But like, this right. is a real thing, and so what? <laughs> you can go see one in the real yeah. world, <laughs> and you know, stomp it into a million pieces. You know, whatever you're into. Very very nice. Wow. Well, uh, okay, that was fun. Well, we also have another card here. Uh, again, we're back in Innistrad, but this is not a flip card. I'm not taking the easy route, okay? Taking a card that I thought they did a fantastic job of showing what can happen if a, uh, a well-known trope were to occur in Magic. And there's certainly the idea that, you know, everything's kind of weird in Innistrad. Everything's gothic, it's horror, it's creepy. Everything's kind of trying to get you. But would you really expect yourself to get yourself? Because Evil Twin 
is a card, and I love yeah. this card so much. It's a black, blue, and two generic mana. For a 0-0 zero, zero rare shapeshifter, you may have it enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield, except it gains black, blue, tap, colon, destroy target creature with the same name as this creature. It's just, it, it clearly takes the form of the other creature. It's killing the other creature because it's the evil twin. It's the evil twin trope. Like, it just, you know, it slices, it dices, it julians. Here we are with evil twin yeah. being awesome. Yeah, and we've seen several takes on this. I think Altered Ego was the one that came back, or like we've seen variations of this where you can clone something and, and all of that. And so, yeah, a very flavorful card. I love the flavor text as well and the idea that it, it really it really exists just to deal with the original. You know, it really doesn't have any purpose other than that, but it does that thing very well. If you happen to be facing a creature deck that it was a specific creature, it still has that ability even though the main creature's gone. So if God forbid they play another one, you still want to be the original and you can kill that too. Right, so yeah, e Evil Twin is was all always neat and fun and i love it what's your what's your favorite evil twin in popular culture um, i'm a big fan i'm a big fan of this the original star trek mirror universe okay and uh, and goatee uh spock is a is a great one i like the bizarro stuff the bizarro superman stuff was always sure fun and interesting and weird um you know the uh there was one where what he's like the red the red superman or whatever superman right. red yeah. that type of stuff yeah all that stuff was really cool to me um, yeah there's also red hulk yeah the, the whole red hulk verse is a great one yeah uh i'm also a big fan of flexo from futurama just because robots can't grow mustaches but <laughs> okay it's a great one moving on here to number three ruben what's your number three so i w once again another excellent trinket text this card doesn't need any flavor text at all because the rules text just does all the work i have such a vivid memory of the first time i saw this card um, I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, hanging out with uh, a bunch of my friends from Cincinnati. This was right before Adam Prozac moved out from Cincinnati to go work at Wizards of the Coast. Uh, Adam Prozac and a bunch of old uh, uh, Cincinnati folks, um, uh, a lot of the folks from the Bridge podcast, people like Peter Johnson, Taylor Gunn, John Douglas, uh, Jack Rannon was there. Uh, just a ton of, of people. And this was during the Theros spoiler season. So we got another Theros card here. And it was midnight after we cube draft and they were like, oh, we got a spoiler card. Let's take a look at what it is. And we put it up on the big screen so we could all read it all at the same time. It was silent for 10 seconds while we all read the card and then finally got to the final line and everyone went, oh my God, what in the world? Because we'd never seen anything quite like 100 handed one nice. before. Uh, 100 handed one is two colorless white white for a three five giant. Uh, originally from Theros. It has Vigilance, and it has Monstrosity of three colorless, white, white, white. Uh, if this creature isn't monstrous, you put three plus one plus one counters on it, and it becomes monstrous. And here's, here's the fun one. As long as 100-handed one is monstrous, it has Reach, and can block an additional 99 creatures each combat. <laughs> <laughs> have you I mean, how, how perfect. Have you ever, like, done that? Like, blocked money creatures? Uh... I have not. I've so it's 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 only ever been uh, you know whenever I've monstrous a hundred handed one, my opponent didn't have over a hundred creatures in play. Right. Turns out, right. But, have you ever just blocked an absurd number of creatures though? Oh sure, I've okay. blocked like four or five. Okay. Yeah, I'll yeah. take it. Uh, yeah, for me, it's basically right before I lost. Uh, I'd be like, oh, I finally got to monstrosity. Oh, everybody, he blocks everybody and he dies, and then next turn I died anyway. Oh. Right. It's fine. It's fine. This was my number eight. Because Perfect. this card is just, there's just too much fun to be had with you can block 99 creatures, even though it's never going to happen, not in the yeah. real world, maybe once in the digital world. But if you're blocking Commander. 99, yeah, but if, well, yeah, but if you're blocking 99, they probably have a million of it. You know what I mean? Like, maybe they yeah, have 15 yeah. tokens in Commander. Right, but it is good, it is good tech on Magic Online if your opponent's going off with Splinter Twin. They got to make a hundred more to attack you. Time them out that way. That'll Time show them out that way. That's right. That's <laughs> what you tap out. That's right. That's right. That's what you get. But also super evocative from old Greek myth. Obviously, Theros is is super uh, flavorful on that standpoint. The Heka the Hecatonkeres were the old Titans uh, who actually helped fight, I believe, on the long, along the side Ooh. of the gods. There were three of them, uh, and they helped fight alongside the gods uh, to to help uh, uh, bring about the current world. Or it could just be E Honda from Street Fighter. Uh, yes. <laughs> That's what I call the Hunter Handed one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Moving on here to uh, number three for me, which is a card that when the first time I saw it, 
I was like, oh my god, I was flipping out on Twitter. I was like, this is one of the best, one of the greatest. I know, right? It never happens. I was like, oh yeah, this car is like the greatest flavor win. I can't stand how good it is, and it's just insane. I think uh, I want to say maybe Sam Starter uh, was either talking to me about it or he designed it, um, one or the other. Uh, but this was when Shadows of Ravenstrad was being spoiled, and I was just like flipping stuff because uh, this is a card that is so perfect when you when you when you look at it. And yeah, it's a flip card, whatever, because the story this one tells is beautiful and just unique and wonderful. Sometimes you just get startled awake. And it's too blue and it's too generic mana. And you're like, is this a mythic sorcery? And target opponent yeah. puts the top 13 cards of their library into their graveyard. Another 13. Yeah. And then you pay two blue and three, two blue and three generic mana, colon, put it from your graveyard onto the battlefield, transformed only during us, only as a sorcery, into persistent nightmare, which is a one one nightmare. It looks like a child chasing yeah, creepy someone. Baby. Creepy baby. It has skulk. Which means this creature can't be blocked by creatures with greater power. And you can't eat the baby. You cannot eat the baby. When okay. Persistent Nightmare deals combat damage to a player, return it to its owner's hand. And it has, so then it would return as the sorcery. Uh, and it has the flavor text of, it seems so real. And it's just, it, it creepy baby come and get you. The baby got you. And then you get to be startled awake again of like, oh my God, I thought the creepy baby was going to get me. <laughs> and then it can't get you. It's so good. So. Yeah, this was another one of those cards. You know, we've talked about it before, but there are there there's a dedicated group of people out there that love a mill deck, and they want nothing more than to mill you out. And I don't know if this ever saw any play in limited. It didn't really see much of the standard, but this was another one that kind of got brewers excited. And you know, if nothing else, the flavor was on point. You know, the idea of you're startled awake, you think that's kind of the end of it, and you try to go back to sleep, and you realize it's not over yet. And yeah, this is very very much a flavor win. Yeah, so cool. I just I love this card front to back. It is terrific. Uh, Aaron, what's number three? So I'm going to stay on Innistrad for my number three. Uh, this card came from Dark Ascension. This is a popular trope in apocalyptic fiction. Um, apocalyptic. <laughs> yeah, uh, apocalyptic. Apocalyptic fiction is a branch of fiction that really relies on sort of the end of the world. And, you know, sometimes you see it with like, you know, dystopian fiction and things of that nature. But my number three has to do with a very popular genre that has really taken over with shows like The Walking Dead. Um, you know, we are approaching Halloween where it's not uncommon to have kind of bar crawls, like zombie bar crawls. And yep. you know, over the last few years, we've seen zombies, you know, kind of break through into the mainstream with movies like Warm Bodies, you know, things of that nature. And you know, no card really sums all of this up than Zombie Apocalypse. Uh, so Zombie Apocalypse is three colorless and three black. It's a sorcery. Return all zombie creatures from your graveyard to the battlefield, tapped, and then destroy all humans, which is very much what happens in zombie apocalypse fiction of these zombies sort of, you know, bust out, whether it be through a virus or whether it be just whatever. And ultimately the humans go down and the humans have to struggle and they're sort of a shell of their former selves. And, you know, no card really hammers that home than this. And the flavor tax is really what pushes it over the top. The, there will come a day so dark that you will pray for death. And on that day, your prayers will be answered. And, you know, the very narrow of just, just bring zombies back and then just kill humans is perfect. And, um, and, it, and you see to sort of the card of just nothing but just this wave of zombies and it's just the perfect perfect callback to a very popular way to kind of end the world well i think what we did here was we went hashtag not on brand to hashtag <laughs> seriously <laughs> this is the brand y'all throwing the brand out dropping the brand mike look y'all returning stuff from the graveyard it's all zombies the kids are dying look all those black pips deal with it you know like i need to drive off in the harley you know what i mean like yeah, this is this is the brand returning home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This car is great. Uh, this is my, my sorry. This was my number six. Nice. Yeah, this is my Balthor EDH deck, which is all zombies. And so if the Balthor plan doesn't work, I'll just do it the hard way. Fine. Here's six. Oh, look, everything I have is a zombie. Great. <laughs> yeah. Weird how that works out. That's Funny. awesome. Oh. It's so good. Yeah, that card is super sweet. Now, as we over here to number two. Uh, my number two is higher on someone else's list. So clearly wow. great minds are thinking like, and I have, I am, I'm, I would call it 95% sure that it's Aaron's, but we'll see. We'll see. Ruben, what's your number two? So a lot of the stories of the planeswalkers are evocative and interesting. A lot of those characters have in cool backstories and a lot of interesting cards associated with them. Um, you know, Jace coming Castaway and, and all of the things associated with his uh, with Ixalan's Binding and things like that are super interesting and fascinating. All of Chandra's backstory, uh, starting on Kaladesh as her spark ignited and she began traveling the multiverse. Uh, Ajani's brother dying and, and Ajani losing his eye. 
uh, as, as that sort of impetus. But I think that there's no uh, more resonant story to me of any of the Planeswalkers, really, than Liliana. Uh, Liliana's story is um, unique and fascinating and uh, uh, just completely original uh, uh, of all the Planeswalkers, a really good anti-hero in Magic. And part of that story is, uh, and there are so many cards that I could pick here, um, Lilian, Heretical Healer, is actually probably the most evocative of the Flip Planeswalkers, I would think. Um, and uh, the, the events that surrounded her, uh, her, her spark igniting and her becoming the Liliana Vest that we know today uh, was that she, uh, after the mending, she made a pact with four demons named Copperfed, Gristlebrand, Razaketh, and Belzenlock to keep her young and powerful forever. Uh, with the Demonic Pact. Demonic Pact is my number two. Uh, it's originally from Magic Origins, and it's two colorless black-black enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, choose one that hasn't been chosen. Demonic Pact deals four damage to any target, and you gain four life. Target opponent discards two cards, draw two cards, or you lose the game. That's sick. Just such an evocative, great way of having a, a, a demonic... Uh, contract um, where you get that power of the underworld and that, uh, the, you know, the coursing through you, the, the, the tattoos that Liliana has along her, along her skin that uh, showcases that uh, demonic power, but it comes at a price. And, uh, and at the end of the demonic pact, well, your soul is forfeit. Um, yeah. yeah. This was my number six. Uh, this is one of the decks that we talk about how sometimes towards the end of or towards the towards the end of a rotation, when when standards about to rotate, they usually release a couple of cards that let certain decks kind of go wild. And Wizards is like, all right, you crazy kids, get two months, have at it. Um, and Cap Pact was a thing. You know, we yep. got Harmless Offering and Shadows of Her Innistrad, which essentially let you give this to somebody, and so you would take it all the way down and be like, here you go. <laughs> Thanks. And unless you have a way to deal with it, you now own Demonic Pact and you've lost the game. Um, there. Are other ways to manipulate this. We had all sorts of bounce spells. I think Silumgar's command was one of them, being able to bounce a permanent, you know, being able to reset it and finding all sorts of ways to do that. Um, and, and being able to even destroy the pack before it gets too far. And so when you were able to really manipulate it to use up all the modes beforehand or just reset it, that's really where the card got value. And you know, there was a there were Chris Patello was a young man. I think he top did a GP with cat packs. Mm -hmm. And so there were a couple months there where people kind of had fun with this. I was one of them and I had all sorts of fun. And sometimes it doesn't work and you lose to your own thing where you're like i got this i got this oh countered my offering ouch and then you lose to your own but that's what you do that is the most black mage thing out there is doing whatever you can for power and sometimes it backfires and you do kind of get consumed by it but yeah, yeah. it's like a player win right there yeah this one was super close to my list i mean i i love the idea choose one that hasn't been chosen it's another mm -hmm. amazing line of text that they just don't use at all on anything else and it's like i understand that you don't want to use it a lot but like this is a great mechanic for a whole bunch of really cool flavorful reasons uh in a whole variety of ways of essentially i want to choose something that's not bad until i can't choose you know i have to do the bad thing uh it would be really interesting but uh yeah well, i feel like we've actually seen a lot more choices being put on cards and we kind of covered it in our guilds of Ravnik set review where I feel like they're kind of moving more in that direction where they don't want cards to be dead you know like in the late game necessarily Knight of Autumn is a really great example of the, you know it's is it ever really a dead card like you right. can gain life or get counters and right. I feel like we're seeing more cards being sent in that direction as opposed to this card just does one thing and one thing only and if you don't have it right start right time it feels bad and I appreciate that they're giving cards more more use more use and, and giving people more choices right and I, I think I also love the flavor of uh this is sort of like an illusion of choice um a, yeah. a contract with some asterisks on it that, a, that a demon might give you i just i just love everything about it yeah it's it's super cool i was thinking more or less kind of more like the uh the punisher mechanic in many ways which is this kind of is but only mm -hmm. for yourself which i, I like yeah. and i think that's really cool um either way let's keep moving here aaron what's your number two my number two is the uh, namesake for a deck in vintage. And, you know, it just, I just can't think of anything more flavorful than this. Just sort of that feeling of, go ahead. And then they're like, no, you go ahead. And, it's like, no, you go ahead. and again, this is another one of those cards, kind of like Demonic Pact, where if you can manipulate it, you can really come out ahead on this transaction. My number two is Standstill. Yep. Uh, so Standstill is one colorless and a blue. It's an enchantment. It says, when, I, when a player plays a spell, 
sacrifice standstill. If you do, each of that player's opponents draws three cards and the flavor text says, take your time. So like on turn one, whoop, and then your opponent's like, well, I need to, I need to do something, but I really don't want to get three cards. Meanwhile, you're playing things like the Mishra's the factories where you can make two twos, you can still get in there. You can play the fairy lands, like the fairy conclave that lets you create creatures. So you're really not having to cast anything. Uh, Rich Shea played a version with Embalm where it's like you find a way to discard things. And you're like, I'll just Embalm nice. this crappy creature that I'm not casting because it's, it's, a, it's an activated ability, it's a good ability. Um, and so finding ways to manipulate it to where your opponent has to cast something. And so essentially, if you play it right, that's a two mana three, you know, three cards cards right there and just sort of you know that mood of like go ahead and then they're like go ahead okay because it can hurt you too if you break and you cast it well then your opponent draws three cards and so it really adds this kind of layer of tension to the game um, and really forces people to play creatively lest you get buried in card advantage yeah this is one of the first cards that i got to play when i sort of returned to magic and i was like you know what's going on in these older formats it's like, well you can play this and beat them down with Misha's <laughs> factories and i was like oh my god i love everything about this <laughs> I can, I can totally just mess with my opponents. I can bait them into doing things. I can make them do things. I, I guess there, there's, I recall the school of thought going back and forth with, you just break it. Like you don't yeah. wait around. You're like, whatever you got me, two mana, three cards, go ahead. Because if you wait too long, that's how they beat you. They want oh you to God. wait. And so you yeah. have to just go through it and just deal with it. Ugh. Yeah. yeah. As uh, as recently as 2016, uh, Landstill won a major vintage tournament at the uh, Eternal Weekend uh, with Joseph Bogard taking a, a Landstill deck uh, to, to the winner's circle. Just uh, uh, And it's been around forever. I mean, it's been an archetype in Old Extended. It's been an archetype in Vintage. It was, I believe it was an archetype in Standard for some reason. I don't particularly recall what the land was. Uh, that, that, it, that it went along with. It might have been something like Nantuko Monastery or something like that. Um, but uh, but yeah, Landstill has been around forever. A huge, long history with Standstill for sure. Yeah, this is a card that if they reprint it, it doesn't matter how bad that Mishra's Factory-esque, Muta Vault-esque land is, somebody's going to put that together and somebody's going to play it because this card is crazy good, crazy powerful, and crazy flavorful, as it turns out. So here we go to number one, and I feel like what's going to happen is that my number one is Ruben's number seven, and my number two is Aaron's number one. But we'll, we'll see. Uh, okay. Aaron, go ahead. What's number one? So my number one is probably the greatest play on words. And I remember when I was in training for my latest job, I, I talked to people all day for my job. And one of the things that we learned at work is how you say things really matters, particularly in a context where people can't see your body language. And so I remember we had to go through this exercise of saying the phrase, I did not steal that cow. But we had to emphasize different words. You'd be like, I did not steal that cow. And then the next line was, I did not steal that cow. And then I did not steal that cow. And, and what a difference emphasizing certain words made. Um, and no no flavor text really embodies this in my number one um, because it just doesn't really do, well, I'll let them tell you. My number one is Null Rod. Oh. Uh, so Null Rod is two colorless. It's an artifact. This is players cannot play any artifact abilities requiring an activation cost. And there's this timeless exchange with Gerard where Gerard says, but it doesn't do anything. And Hannah says, no, it does nothing. And yeah. like, just, again, that emphasizing of the words and sort of the play on words here, there's just no other flavor text like it. This is a staple in vintage where artifacts really run the world, whether it be just the zero casting cost mana rocks or whether it be something like workshops. Um, this is a a main deckable card in Vintage. You can main deck a Null Rod and be perfectly okay. Um, there are games where sometimes you lock yourself out with your Null Rod, but you gotta kind of weigh it of, are they gonna be hurt more than I am? And so just the idea that a card can do nothing is just so cool. And um, to me, there's just nothing more flavorful than something that just, you know, does nothing. And so you look at it and you might think, like Gerard, if it doesn't do anything, and it's like, no girl, it's doing what it's supposed to do. And, and we've seen this kind of in Damping Sphere, which most recently came on Dominaria. If you look really closely at the art, again, you see what appears to be a beautiful starry night and you see this sort of beautiful, beautiful, beautiful wilderness. But if you look really closely, there's that sphere of like null, where like it's just nothing. And the idea that nothing can be a thing, I think is so fantastic. And this card really embodies that. Oh my gosh, the idea, well, first of all, I was wrong. Um, secondly, I love Null Rod. I just, I love Null Rod <laughs> eight ways to Sunday. And yeah. I was like, should I have included? I don't know if I should include it. I put it on so many lists. I love the you know, so I, I chose something differently there. Um, which means crazily enough, Ruben has my number two, which is really neat. Wow. Um, however, 
Uh, and, and again, I think my number one is, is number seven, but uh, no rod again, monster flavorful card. It is the no rod, which no means nothing like it's 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 terrific. Yeah. Ruben, what's your number one? My number one. So I wanted to choose the the iconic characters from Magic to be my highest on the list. I really love the trinket text of Hundred Handed One and Obsidian Fireheart. I love the story that Zombie Apocalypse and Shahrazad tell. Uh, obviously, all of the flip cards and and all of the the uh, the interesting stories that those can tell. And we got a Planeswalker story at number two, but there have been legends throughout Magic's history that are super evocative and interesting in their stories and their backgrounds. But very rarely do I come across a card that I read, know the history of, and then I'm just like, it just punches you in the chest with, if, if you know the information of the card, what the card does with the combination of the flavor text is just a powerful, I mean, I, I very rarely have an emotional reaction to magic cards. And I think that the most powerful one I've had to a magic card in the last five years, at least, has been Felden of the Third Path. Mm. Felden of the Third Path is a colorless red-red 2-3 human artificer, legendary creature originally from Commander 2014. Uh, the ability is two colorless and a red tap. Create a token that's a copy of target creature card in your graveyard, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types. It gains haste. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Uh, the flavor text reads, she will come back to me, which is a reference to uh, Felden's uh, love interest uh, in the story long ago to a woman, an Ar 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 Argivian woman or Argivian Ar woman Ar Ar named Lauren. Argivian, mm -hmm. yeah, who dies. Um, but then Felden, who is an artificer, becomes obsessed uh, with trying to figure out how to bring her back and tries building an automaton. Uh, to sort of replace her, um, uh, and, and it doesn't really work. You know, he concludes that there's nothing that would really actually replace the woman that he loved, and it's just such a sad um, story, and it's, and it's told perfectly in the rules text of this card. Yeah, and it's sad because he keeps trying. And if I understand the story correctly, he just I think he destroys them. Like once yeah. they're not working, he kind of well. You know, I actually I actually read oh. this story today. Uh, not the oh. not the whole thing because near the end you can kind of see where it was going. I kind of skimmed the mm -hmm. last little bit, but the the first parts of it are amazing. Ashnod uh, tortured his wife, mm -hmm. and after the Urza Mishra War, they all lived except she had what they don't call cancer, but sounds like cancer essentially that mm -hmm. she slowly wasted away. And then she finally died. And he, uh, he was able to build, you know, trinkets and automatons. And so he, he, uh, he got a power stone from probably Tolarian Academy to kind of hint at that. Um, and he, he built this thing that looked very much like her, but not enough. So he tore it down and he did it again. And this one looked very, very much like her, but all of the little clicks and the tings and the, the, the starts and the stops of the mechanical bits started to irritate him and really get on his nerves. And he couldn't stop hearing it. And it wasn't, it wasn't her. It wasn't what he wanted. And he finally just, he took the power stone out and let it rot and rust on top of her grave yeah. because he didn't really want it anymore. And so then he started his travels to going to different, uh, different people who had different, uh, focuses and mana. They wouldn't go to the green mage who could only work with living things, couldn't work with dead things. And he went to the black mage who could give him a sort of projection, almost like a ghost like appearance of his, of his dead wife, but not the real thing. Uh, then he goes to the really fun. And this is just huge spoilers. If you want to go ahead and scoot for because I thought this was a great bit. He goes to another black mage when he was unsatisfied. And she said, well, uh, her price, the first black mage's price was he just had to tell stories about his wife. Well, the second one said, I want your cane. And he's like, this, this cane is, is a part of me. I got it from a glacier a long time ago. I've had it. He's, right. like, he's like, well, what's more important to you? A lump of metal or, or you love your life. And he's like, here's the cane. And he gave yeah. away Feldman's cane in that, in that story there. Uh, and he taught him how to do some, you know, some amount of reanimation magic or whatever. And he goes back to his little tent or his hut and he, and he does so. And then all of a sudden he hears something juicy and wet slamming into the door. <laughs> and he's like, and all of a sudden, instead of opening the door, He's holding it closed because he's scared to death and he can hear it like wet and gurgly and yeah. smashing on the door. And finally, finally, he kind of wishes it away and he doesn't hear it anymore. And the next day he doesn't see any like signs of anything or whatever. 
and he doesn't mess with that anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I could have sworn if I remember, because I remember having this card on one of my previous top 10 lists, and if I remember the Gamepedia article, he does eventually kind of get a happy ending where like, he does either, right. you know, make peace with that or maybe he finds somebody else, but he does sort of get, you know, his, he does sort of get a peaceful life and he does end up leading a good life. You know, it isn't all darkness and sadness, but yeah, you know, there's just so much about that card. The fact that he has to do that, the fact that he keeps destroying them, the fact that he's the one who's doing it, that he keeps remaking them. There's so much to that. And yeah, I think, I think, you know, red, people forget that red is really the color of passion. And a lot of people think it's more about like, and creativity, you know, yeah. right. And I think a lot of people think it's more about the erratic and the fiery and the danger, but some of it is just, there's a lot of heart in red and this card really, really sums that up nicely. Right. And I had uh, a hard time deciding which legend I wanted to. I knew I was going to put a legendary creature at number one. I knew it was going to happen. Um, there were a couple of, of nominees on my list that were really flavorful and told the story of what the character is like. Captain Cissé was great at recruiting other super powerful figures to, to her side and to her aid aboard the Weatherlight. So that one was near the top of my list. Tabo Tavok, who is an old uh, villain from the past who uh, uh, was, a, was, a, was a main rival of Gerard. Um, there were just so many choices to choose from of the old legends, but I felt like Felden was just resonated on a level with me that was deeper than any other. Yeah, I mean, again, you hear the story, and then he's making the automaton that looks just like the creature in your graveyard, but it doesn't satisfy us, so you have to get rid of it. Like, it's yeah. it's just beautiful. It is, again, my number two, um, which means by process of elimination, Ruben's number seven must be my number one, because let me tell you a little story. My little bro ham named Prometheus. Now, oh! now Prometheus was a uh, titan, if you will, a culture hero. He was credited with the creation of man from clay, but he defied the gods by stealing fire and giving it to the humans. And that's not cool. We weren't supposed to get that. That's not nice. So that's a problem. Well, Zeus was pissed and Zeus, the king of the Olympian gods. Well, he sentenced the titan to eternal torment. Now note that the, uh, that the, in ancient Greece, the liver was where they thought all of your emotions were, you know, not your heart. It was, right. it was your liver, right? You had, you had the four, um, what was it? The four, uh, four liquids or the four spirits. I forget what they're called. Something like that. But either way, the idea that I'm, about, I'm going to explain his punishment and it's going to make me a lot more sense when you knowing that, because, uh, what happened was Zeus bound him. For humors. That's what it was. The humors. For humors. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Zeus bound him to a rock, and each day an eagle, the emblem of Zeus, would be sent to feed on his liver, which would then grow back overnight to be eaten again the next day. And in some stories, Prometheus is freed at last by the hero uh, Hercules. So we'll, we'll, we'll I, I like the happy ending in that story versus just you just keep getting your eater, liver eaten every day. <laughs> yeah. But that means my number one is chained to the rocks. It's so. Yeah good it's so flavorful it wins in so many ways it wins both in being powerful it wins in both being part of color pies it wins in the idea that you're you're sticking this card to that card and it's mana cost and it's verbiage and, and its picture is fantastic nothing about this card is not spot on for me chain to the rocks is one white for a rare enchantment aura and you enchant a mountain you control. And when it enters the battlefield, you exile target creature and opponent controls until Chain to the Rocks leaves the battlefield. Um, that's just so good. It's just so, so rich in telling this story and understanding every part of it. Yeah, C's play in the sideboard of, of burn strategies. You know, burn sometimes can't deal with, with big things. You know, they either have to spend multiple burn spells on it or they need to try to race you before that big thing kills you. And this is just a really clean, efficient answer. Odds are you're not bringing an enchantment removal against burn. Um, and so this is a really great kind of sneaky way for them to deal with big creatures. Path is another one, but you get a basic land. And so right. you really want to cover your base say you get nothing you know you're probably not bringing an enchantment hate against me and i don't want you to get anything out of this it's just a very clean efficient answer to things and yeah i remember when this card first came out it was very much celebrated as just a design win just not only yep. in flavor but it's just how it, it just was so good in the color pie and really did what those colors wanted to be doing absolutely so yeah just a beautiful design uh obviously this was my number my number seven um also uh another i mean people being changed to a rock have a uh, a long and illustrious history throughout movies and tropes and stories and stuff. There's also the, the tale of Andromeda, uh, who was uh, uh, an, another ancient Greek myth, which sort of gave birth to the the princess in distress kind of motif that we see all the time today. Um, and and it's just it's just such an I mean I love playing this card because I'm a Boros mage as well, 
uh, you know, playing aggro decks and having a one mana clean answer and tying somebody to my mountain is awesome. <laughs> Come here. Just imagining like an Eldrazi tied to the mountain. Yeah, it's yep. great to it's great to envision as well. You know, and I feel like a lot of the best flavor cards are like even Smuggler's Copter. I mean, I remember when Smuggler's Copter came out, people were like, Can you imagine like a Rurik Far in a Smuggler's Copter? Right. Like, <laughs> Galta just driving the little right. thing you know, rah, <laughs> coming to get you. Oh yeah. wow. So yeah, Chain to the Rocks just just did it for me in every in every different way. Yeah, uh, but fell into the third path is certainly, certainly up there. That's... You know, I mentioned earlier how I can't hear Arabian Nights without thinking of the theme song. Whenever I hear Chain to the Rocks, uh, No Doubt, one of No Doubt's earliest songs was called Trapped in a Box. And oh. so whenever I hear Chain to the Rocks, I hear Chain to the Rocks. And I'm just like, <laughs> my mind goes to weird word association places. Nice. I, I don't got that one, unfortunately, but <laughs> you got the Arabian Nights in the Arabian days. So um, somebody on YouTube, listen to No Doubt's early stuff. Help me out here. Nice. <laughs> Well, look, that was our top 10 flavorful cards. You will see them on the screen right now for your review. Take a look at my list, Aaron's list, Ruben's top 10. And we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about. And we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. But before we go, I want to thank my co-host. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. And I'm really excited to see what you guys suggest. So there's so many choices. Let us yeah. know because we probably missed a ton. Absolutely. This will be a tough one to, to decide who's going to get the honorable mention. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ruben. Hmm. This episode is so funny. <laughs> oh, God. Mm. The, the lish, the lish, if you will. <laughs> We're here to our final slide. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com. My co-hosts, Aaron Campbell and Ruben Bressler, you guys for watching or listening, and hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that helps people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv at Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, our Magic Mics subreddit, and like the Magic Mics page on Facebook. Talk to us privately at Magic Mics Podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio-only podcast at Magic Mics Podcast at Libsyn.com, or find us on iTunes, or join us here next week. Same time, same place for another episode of Magic Mics. Good night, everybody.